morning. I'd love to. That was an excellent presentation by Anna. But I think I realize a lot of you have gone back into your cocoons, into your scientific clubs, and you're probably thinking about all the amazing work that you do in there. So I'm glad that I've come right after her so that I can bring you out of there and we can discuss a bit about how to communicate about this technology. Um, as Serena said, my name is Bibiana. I work for the International Service for the Acquisition um, of Agribiotech Applications, ISA. And you've probably um, heard a lot about us. We do a lot of um, knowledge sharing on crop biotechnology. Um, and our mission really is to see that people make informed decisions um, in as far as agricultural biotechnology is concerned. I'll be looking at this from uh, the perspective of application um, in agricultural, I mean, in, in, in agriculture. So at the heart of everything that we do at ISA, and some of what you are doing at the lab is women like bees. Let's call one of them Wanjiko. Um, we are doing a lot of research so that we're able to benefit women like this, so that this research is able to translate um, into practice and into policy that um, is informed, that trickles down and uh, um, are able to, to benefit um, women like this. So in Africa, a lot of work is currently ongoing um, in as far as application of genome editing in agriculture. Um, we have uh, projects that are looking at improving uh, banana, so banana streak virus, that, that's ongoing in Kenya, uh, being led by Dr. Lina Tripathi at the um, IITA. And then we also have some work that is ongoing and is trying to um, improve the yam and basically just make it a bit more nutritious. Um, we also have um, some research that's currently taking place that's trying to um, address a very important food, security, um, uh, food crop in, the, in a lot of African countries, and this is the maize crop that has been uh, devastated by the maize lethal necrosis. Um, so there's a, a genome editing project um, currently ongoing um, in a number of countries trying to build resistance against uh, the ma uh, maize lethal necrosis. Um, we also have um, a project currently ongoing in Kenya um, together with Kotiva and a, a big university in Kenya trying to address a striga resistant in sorghum. So sorghum is a, is a very important crop in Kenya, um, but we lose a lot of it uh, because of striga, and, and this is also um, the same for maize. Um, and so um, we have a collaborative uh, research project by Kotiva um, and Kenyatta University um, trying to uh, use genome editing to develop striker um, resistance, uh, striker resistance sorghum in Africa. Um, and then we also have a project that is uh, uh, being conducted by BECA. BECA stands for the Biosciences Eastern and Central Africa Hub uh, that's based at the International Livestock Research Institute. Um, and they're trying to uh, work on GRASP for enhanced nutritional and, and, and agronomic um, traits. Um, and then we also have another one that's looking at uh, pearl millet. We're trying to improve the pearl millet. Um, and it's in collaboration with ICRISAT. Again, pearl millet is an important food security crop for smallholder farmers in, uh, uh, in Africa. Um, and so we're trying to improve, and they're trying to improve uh, the product so that um, farmers can, can, uh, can be able to, uh, I mean, the technology can be able to address some of the farmer challenges that farmers um, face. And then in Ethiopia, and I've seen a number of Ethiopians in the room, and I also got to learn that there is another project um, that Addis Ababa University is currently doing. But um, Kotiva, again, together with the Agricultural Research Institute in Ethiopia, is working to improve TEF. TEF is a national and very important food crop in, um, in Ethiopia, and basically just trying to, to improve the crop um, and increase its seed size, increase its, its productivity, and reduce... Um, the lodging. Again, and then just to highlight a few other projects that, that we're currently seeing starting to take place, we know that Burkina Faso is working on rice. We know that South Africa um, is, is starting to look at uh, GRIP um, Kenya, the International Potato Center, is looking at using the, the technology to improve the potato. And again, Senegal, we hear that uh, ICRISAT is looking at um, uh, working on ground. So there's a lot of work, um, and I think this is just to set the ground and, and, and tell you that there's a lot of work that is currently ongoing in Africa 
um, in as far as application of genome editing um, in Africa. But uh, in as far as the, the regulations are concerned, we only have three countries so far in Africa that have really started looking at how do we regulate um, this, this technology. And so in South Africa, um, the conversation is around you know, looking at a pro product-based um, regulatory trigger. So they're saying that the current framework that they have is adequate. They have a GMO bill that, and, and, and a framework that looks at GMOs. And so they're saying if, if the genome editing then induces or the, the application you end up with, with a product that is genetically modified, then that will follow the, the GM framework. Um, in Kenya, we have draft guidelines, and I was also very happy to see that our regulator is in the room, and I think he'll talk more about what uh, the direction that Kenya is taking in regards to regulating the technology. Um, and so basically, we're saying we're going to have two scenarios where we have the non-GMO um, and then where, where we have the transgene-free products of GE, um, and those will not be regulated as GMOs. Um, and then in Nigeria, we know that they recently, a couple of months ago, reviewed their Biosafety Act um, to include genome editing. And I think what they're going to do now or what they're currently discussing is how do they um, then come up with guidelines to, to see how they're going to regulate um, the technology. So those are, those are the three current countries currently um, in Africa that have really started looking at how to regulate um, genome editing. So in the media, the conversation obviously is starting to, to take place. People are, the media is starting um, to pick the discussions um, and we've been seeing a lot of stories. A lot of them have been you know, a bit a good, you know, good positive stories, um, but we've also seen that some activists are starting to, to come in and, and push some negative um, stories in there and they're trying to basically bungle up genome editing together with GMOs and synthetic biology and they're saying that there's a group of people that are in their labs messing around with nature and, um, and so trying to push that kind of narrative. And for us um, at ISA, we, we, we realized that it was very important that we stay ahead and we make sure that even as the technology progresses, that the communication component moves along together with that. Um, and again, uh, we saw the EU make a decision recently um, that uh, gen GMOs to, or the rules for GMOs to cover plant genome editing technique as well. And this was very worrying for us um, as a region because we know um, historically that Africa tends to follow the decisions that are made uh, by the EU. So we thought it was very important to bring people together and to start having a conversation about this technology. How do we regulate it? What does it mean to us? And that's the reason why then we came together um, and had the Africa Biosciences, Bio Biosciences um, uh, co communication symposium uh, that Serena just talked about. So this uh, was a symposium that we held in August of this year. We held it in South, South Africa. And basically what we felt is that it was important that the communication keeps pace with the rapid advancements that we were seeing in research and we start having discussions about how to regulate um, this technology. How do we get the communication about this technology right? How do we not make the mistakes that we did um, when we were talking about GMOs? And for us to do that, we brought a number of participants together from across the, blo uh, the globe, very diverse pa participants, people in science, regulators, science communicators, some policy makers, we brought in editors from the largest media houses um, in Africa, and a lot of industry players, and we had, you know, a, a lot of uh, different sort of sessions, practical sessions, uh, sorry, I mean, um, yeah, practical sessions, we had sessions uh, for uh, panel discussions, and, you know, you can see Serena, then we were very excited about having an all-female panel in, in such a conference. So a lot of discussions going on about um, how do we communicate the technology, uh, and we were looking at three key objectives objectives when, when we put the, this symposium together, one of them being cross-examining the various regulatory options. Um, so we had people, uh, regulators from across the, uh, the globe, um, people from Argentina who have made a lot of progress in as far as regulating this technology is concerned, um, from the US, just basically coming to talk to our regulators about the progress that they have made and some of the decisions that maybe they can borrow from them. Um, and their experiences there, and also looking at the communication approaches for that. 
we wanted um again to share a number of exp- uh, to share some experiences and be able to identify effective stakeholder engagement strategies for genome editing in in Africa so we realized that maybe we were not very effective in when when we were looking at the gm debate uh, in as far as engaging stakeholders and developing messages that resonated with stakeholders so it was very important to us to to you know come up uh, with uh, with some lessons um, on how we can do this better this time round, and then also look at how we can optimize the media um, to communicate about genome editing. And we're able to do this under three thematic areas. So we had a thematic area that just looked at the overview of the global policy and uh, regulatory landscape. And then we also had very deep discussions about how do we frame this narrative. Um, and then uh, lastly, looking at stakeholder complexity, we have different people uh, working together. How do we regulate? I mean, how, how are we able to bring in the complexities um, of the different stakeholders and address them effectively um, so that the technology is able to move forward? So under the first thematic area, uh, one of the key lessons that we learned is that it's very important that we're able to bring in the scientists and the regulators in the same room to start having these discussions because you're asking people, um, the regulators in this case, to govern a technology that they probably don't have much knowledge about. So one of the key things that we learned and we saw as a key outcome for ABBC was that it was the first time um, for African regulators to actually meet with potential applicants, and these are the scientists, and deliberate on these regulations. Um, and then we were also really able to expose, because we had the head of biosafety agencies ac across a number of African countries in the meeting. So we were able to really expose them to the global governance of genome editing. They got to see what a number of countries were doing. And because a lot of them haven't started looking at how to regulate the technology, we expect that they will go back and pick some of the lessons from this symposium to see how they can then start to develop their regulatory frameworks. Um, and then we also had a conversations about how they, as the regulators, can also start effectively uh, communicating about the technology. So from the second outcome, and this was um, framing us trying to look at how we can frame the narrative, we had a number of media editors um, and science communicators and people who head the science, technology, and innovative innovation committees or commissions in their countries um, were able to bring them together and have a science cafe so that we could discuss about the gaps and the, and the issues between these two constituents. Wh wh why is it that we've been unable to educate the public effectively on these technologies? Um, what are the gaps and what are the challenges? And we were happy that uh, when able to empower a number of key players um, with communication tips on how they can get CRISPR right, how do they communicate about this technology effectively, and a lot of um, lessons were picked, a lot of strategies uh, were, were picked, and on, were able to identify uh, key barriers between uh, the editors and the media and the scientists. Um, and now that we know what these gaps are, these are some of the things that we feel are going to be very instrumental in, in um, informing some of the communication strategies on genome editing across the region. And we're also able to uh, identify, look at how we identify stakeholder complexities, looking at you know what are the stakeholders and what are their values, um, what kind of messages do we develop uh, so that we're able to make sure that we're addressing uh, the stakeholder concerns, um, and then how do we manage stakeholder conflict? So a lot of issues were able to, to be identified in that, and uh, some of the key outcomes is that we're able to really expand our network. Um, we had a, a declaration, and uh, I'll, I'll point you out to the website where we can see the dec declaration, and basically uh, this was African players coming together and say that they, that they resolved to, to you know, really get their hands in there and try and get this technology right. And then we also agreed that we need to set up a coalition for communicating about gene, genome editing. So that was a proposed coalition. So what did we do wrong in the past and what have we learned? One of the things that uh, we saw is that with the technology, and I think I, I saw this also coming up um, in Anna's presentation, that we, we overclaimed the benefits. We say that it was a revolutionary technology. And, and we're saying that we, know we need to be a bit more careful in as far as this technology is concerned. We do not want to over, overclaim the benefits. We told people that GMOs would feed the world. Um, so maybe we need to start talking about it as a transformative other than a revolutionary technology. 
Um, the other mistake I think that we made with uh, the GMOs is we based our communication on what we call the knowledge deficit theory. We said that people are not making the right decisions because they do not know what this technology is about. And we assumed that if we tell them about the technology, if we feed them the science, then they're going to accept uh, whatever it is um, that, that we, are, we are telling them. And we've learned that increasing knowledge does not necessarily lead um, to acceptance. There are other factors that we have to, that have to come in play to convince people about this technology. Um, we explained the process a lot uh, more than the products attributes. How the people are going to benefit from the from the from the from the products and the technology, but we kept explaining what these processes are. And I think this is something that is a huge, huge challenge for scientists. The, te the technical jargon, unfortunately, tended to dominate the debate with a lot of non-technical audiences. So the people, the, the ladies I showed you at the beginning, you know, when you come to them and you start talking to them about CRISPR, about talents, about zinc nuclear, you know, I mean, you've lost them totally. So again, we have to be very careful and think through um, how, how, how we're going to simplify some of what we're saying and make it applicable and relevant to, to our different audiences. And then, um, and unfortunately, this was the case in Africa. A lot of our scientists and a lot of our regulators sat back as other people miscommunicated on their behalf. So um, we need also, we also learned that emotional ad attitudes are not countered by factual arguments. So again, just going back to the, the knowledge deficit and assuming that the more information we give people, the more they'll understand. Um, so the starting point we have realized is that we need to really think through who our stakeholders are and start thinking about, you know, we have those people who are strongly in support of the technology that we probably don't need to spend too much time talking to. And we also have those who strongly oppose it. No matter what you tell them, they will never accept it. We don't need to spend our energies on those people. We need to focus our efforts on those who support it but have a few concer uh, concerns and those who oppose it but could be convinced when given the right information. Um, and so one of um, our presenters, Dr. Craig Comick, a renowned science communicator from, South, uh, from Australia, sorry, came up with a very interesting formula. This is by no way scientific. <laughs> he said, so we can have a yes, but, you know, the people who say yes, but need more information. And the no, however, you, so they say no, however, if you tell me that it's safe, I'll, cons uh, I'll, I'll, I'll consume it or I'll accept it. But you factor that together with trust. Make sure that people who they trust are the ones speaking to them. Um, and you make sure that we, we are factoring in their emotions and their concerns. And then if we put this all together, then maybe we might be able to have some communication impact. So I really look looking at these stakeholders, who are we speaking to, what do they care about, what are their needs, what are their goals, and what are then the ideal strategies that we can use to be able um, to affect them. So going forward, this is what we're saying that we need to do to get it right, shared values. We need to understand who our stakeholders are and, and, and what they want to know about genome editing and what they care most about it. So that when we're developing our messages, we make sure that our messages resonate with what their concerns are. Uh, we need to factor in trust and establish the stakeholders that they trust most about this technology um, and make sure that we empower those that they trust with their capacity to talk about this technology, and we have to do that early. Um, and then also looking at the knowledge gap, appreciate that we are talking to a diverse group of stakeholders who have very, very limited knowledge on uh, plant breeding methods in general. Um, so how do we um, engage them? Again, looking at the difference between evolution and revolution, and then make sure that we as a group think through the type of analogies and visuals that we want to use to be able to explain this science, but also not oversimplifying it. What are the terminologies um, that we want to collectively use um, that can be able to, 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 to communicate or um, get the message to the, the various stakeholders that we have. Um, and so our ask to partners is, is that you join and support the operational, operationalization of uh, the coalition for, for genome editing, for communicating about genome editing, which we are really just starting to, to put together. Um, we want to have data-driven communication and outreach, so understand the knowledge, perceptions, and attitudes of people so that we are able to have informed communication approaches. 
um, and also just starting to really look at the social media space. We know a lot of people are in social media consuming information. Um, so we want to, to be able to build the capacity of experts to be able to, to get on this space so that the, they can start communicating about um, this technology in that space as well. Thank you very much.